Alrighty then, this is a question about circular motion, uniform circular motion. And maybe you can pause for a second and read the question. And hopefully after you've read the question, you realize that this is a binary star system that is two stars orbiting around their common center of mass. And um, one of them has a mass capital M. The second one has three times that mass where that value is given. And the distance between them, center to center, is given as 2 times 10 to the 10 meters. And then the following sequence of questions will guide you to calculate the period of rotation of the system. This is what we're looking for in the very end. But part A is asking about the position of the center of mass of the system, and that makes sense because they are orbiting around their common center of mass. So the first thing we need to find out is where the center of mass is. So the situation is as follows. I have a mass, capital M, and a mass three times that. And the distance between them is given as D, capital D. And that's the uh, center to center mass. And I expect, because one of the masses is bigger than the other one, I expect that the center of mass would be closer to the heavier one. And in fact, the ratio between them tells me exactly where it is, but um, I can just use the equation to calculate the position of the center of mass. First of all, the, the center of mass is going to lie on the line connecting the two. There is no question about that. It can't possibly be away from it. Because again, you could, you could apply this to an x and y axes and you'll find that the y would have to be right on the line. There is no question about that. You can do it if you want to. Basically if I have the x-axis passing through the two centers then both of the positions are going to be zero so the position of the center of mass is going to have to be zero. But now we're talking about the position of the center of mass on that line and the position of the center of mass is given by the weighted positions of the different masses weighted by the value of the mass and all of these posi positions have to be measured from the same reference and in fact that reference is arbitrary you can choose it wherever you like you could choose it right at the center of this mass you could choose the center of the mass you could choose it right in the middle it's really up to you where you choose that reference Typically, you would choose the reference, the x equals 0, right at one of the masses, just so that it would fall out of the equation. But in fact, that should not really affect your choice, like your choice should not really affect the, the answer that you find. So let's say I'm going to choose this to be the x equals 0. So that means that this point x equals d. And then wherever the x center of mass comes out to be is going to be also measured from that reference. So then um, I could say for part A, I could say that the x center of mass is equal to the weighted average of all the positions and I only have two masses, so I only need to include two terms. And if I sub in with the values that are given in the question, mass 1 is going to be capital M, but its position is what I picked to be position x equals 0. Mass 2 is going to be 3 capital M, and its position is going to be D and then divided by the sum of the masses, m plus 3m. So you'll see then that the 0 would cancel this term, this whole term, and it's going to be 3m times d over 4m, so that's 3 quarters d. d is 2 times 10 to the 10 meters, so that's equal 1.5 times 10 to the 10 meters. Right, because 2 over 4 gives me a half, 3 times a half is 1 and a half. So that's part A. Part B is asking about, for each of the stars, 
identify and calculate the force responsible for keeping the star in orbit. So now we're talking about the circular motion. And in this case, because I found out that the center of mass is going to be right um, three quarters of the distance measured from here, so the center of mass is confirmed to be closer to the star like I expected. So this would be the center of motion because I was told in the head of the question, I was told that the two stars orbit their center of mass. So, um, so then the two stars are going to be orbiting around this point. So this is the center of rotation. So the radius of rotation for this star is going to be this distance, which is 3 quarters d. And the radius of rotation for this massive star is going to be the remaining distance, which is going to be quarter d. So just uh, sort of as a margin, if you will, for star 1, the mass is equal to capital M. The radius of rotation, radius of circular motion, is going to be 3 quarters d. And for star 2, the mass is 3m. The radius of rotation is going to be d over 4. Now, because these stars are undergoing circular motion, that means there has to be some centripetal force. And the question B was asking, what is the nature of that centripetal force? Where does it arise from? Because the force responsible for keeping the stars in orbit is the centripetal force, and the question is, identify and calculate that. Of course, these two stars, away from each other, away from anything else um, in the world, the only force that actually affects them is the gravitational force. And if you remember, the gravitational force, the gravitational force was always attractive, so pointing towards each other, towards the gravitating body, so if the two, the two forces are pulling each other, the two masses are pulling each other, and it's given by Newton's law for universal gravitation, which is the gravitational constant, capital G, multiplied by the first mass, multiplied by the second mass, divided by the distance between them squared. And the fact that we called it R back then does not mean anything about the radius of rotation or anything like that. It's just a symbol for the distance between them squared. Uh, the gravitational constant is given by this number. And the only thing that you need to remember is that this is always attractive force. So it makes sense then that it's pointing towards the center of rotation because that's the centripetal force, where the centripetal force points. So um, then in this case, the centripetal force is the gravitational force. And in fact, it's equal for both stars. And it's given by, maybe I'll use a red for this, because this is a, a law. The gravitational force is equal to the gravitational constant multiplied by the first mass multiplied by the second mass divided by the distance between them squared. So it doesn't matter what symbol you use for the distance between them. Um, and here we've used the symbol capital D. So maybe I'll just use that. Okay, so if I put in some values for this, then um, actually, let me just work it out. G, capital M is the first mass, and then the second mass is 3M. And then, like we said, the distance between them is D. So that means it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared kilogram uh, over kilogram squared multiplied by the, the mass is given as 3 times 10 to the 30 kilograms and the second mass is 3 times 3 times 10 to the 30 
kilograms. And then the distance between them was the 2 times 10 to the 10 meter. And that's going to be squared. What I know then is that the 6.67, I mean, you could punch this in your calculator and you'll figure out exactly the answer. This is 2 thirds times 10 to the minus 10, right? 0.6666667. So it's 2 thirds times, if I move this one over, this becomes a 10 to the minus 10. And this is 3 times 3 to the 10 to the 30 squared. So that's 9 times 10 to the 60 over. 2 times 10 to the 10 squared, that's 4 times 10 to the 20. So the 3 goes with the 3. 2 goes with one of the 2's down here, becomes a 2. So that's 10 to the minus 10 times 10 to the 60, that means 10 to the 50, divided by 10 to the 20, that's 10 to the 30. And that's 9 over 2, so that's 4 and a half. 9 over 2, 4 and a half times 10 to the 30 newtons. So this is the force, the gravitational force that is keeping both of the stars in orbit. It's the same force. So that's part B. So for part C, the question is, what is the tangential velocity for each of the stars? And this is uniform circular motion problem. So to remind ourselves, if there's an object of mass m circulating on a circle of radius r with some tangential velocity v sub t, that tangential velocity, of course, is going to be equal to the distance covered, which is the circumference of that circle, divided by capital T, which is the period, which is the time of one revolution. And then because of that circular motion, there is a centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center. And that centripetal acceleration is given by the square of the tangential speed divided by the radius of the circular motion. Because there is acceleration, net acceleration, that means there is a net force, according to Newton's second law, that is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by that centripetal acceleration. So then the centripetal force is given by the mass of the object multiplied by the tangential speed squared divided by the radius of that circular motion. And in fact, this is the key to solving this part C, which asks about the tangential velocity or the tangential speed. And in this case, because we've just calculated the force, which is the centripetal force in this case, then that force is going to be related to the tangential velocity by the mass and the radius. And we have the masses and the radii for both stars, so we're going to be able to calculate the tangential speed for each of them. So then I could write that the centripetal force, which is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is equal to the mass times the tangential velocity squared, the tangential speed squared over the radius, that means that the tangential velocity squared is going to be equal to the centripetal force multiplied by the radius divided by the mass. Because I multiply both sides by the radius and divide both sides by the mass, this is what I get. So for start one, the tangential velocity, tangential speed squared, is equal to the force that I've just calculated, 4.5 times 10 to the 30 newtons, because this, is, this represents the centripetal force in this case, multiplied by the radius of motion for star 1 is 3 quarters d, divided by the mass m, of that star. If I put the numbers in, 
So that's four and a half times 10 to the 30 newtons multiplied by three quarters d, which is two times 10 to the 10 meters divided by the mass, which is three times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Okay, so I have three quarters times two. First of all, the three goes with the three, and then the two cancels with the four, leaves me with a half. So it's four and a half times 10 to the 30, but half of that. So then equals to 2.25 times 10 to the 30 goes with the 30. So I'm left with 10 to the 10. Okay, and it's meters squared per second squared. So if this is the tangential speed squared, so that means that the tangential speed is the square root of this number, which if you put in your calculator, you find the answer. But you can see right away that this is 2.25, which is the square of 1.5. The reason we know that is the square of 15 is 225. And the square root of 10 to the 10 is 10 to the 5. So that's 1 and a half times 10 to the 5 meters per second. So this is the tangential speed for star number one. For star number two, the tangential speed squared is again the centripetal force, which is the same force multiplied by the radius divided by the mass, but for star two, the radius is d over four and the mass is three m. So that's d over four over three m. So that's equal to four and a half times 10 to the 30 newtons multiplied by the quarter of the distance. So that means it's half times 10 to the 10 meters. Quarter of two is half divided by the 3m, so that's 3 times 3 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So you'll see that the 3 gives me 1 and a half. 1 and a half divided 3 is another half, so that's half times a half times 10 to the 9. So it's half, sorry, times 10 to the 10, times half times 10 to the 10 meters squared per second squared. So that means then that Vt is equal to half times 10 to the 5. Because it's the square root of this number. So it's half times a half, I take square root, I take one of them. 10 to the 10 is 10 to the 5 times 10 to the 5, I take one of them. So these are the two tangential speeds. And that answers part C. For part D, the question is, calculate the time period required to complete a full revolution for each of the stars. The time period is related to the tangential speed, which we've just calculated by the circumference of the, the revolution the motion, the circular motion. So then I could say for part D that the tangential speed is equal to the circumference divided by the period. So that means then that the period is equal to the circumference divided by the speed. So for star one, the period is equal to 2 pi times the radius. And for star 1, we said that's 3 quarters d divided by the velocity, the speed that we've just calculated for star 1. Sorry, that's it. 1 and a half times 10 to the 10 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. So that's equal to 2 pi's. And I have the 3 quarters d is 1 and a half. 
times 10 to the 5, uh, 10 to the 10, I'm sorry, 10 to the 10 meters. And the velocity is 1.5 times 10 to the 5. So that gives me 1.5 goes with 1.5. It gives me 2 pi times 10 to the 5 seconds for star 2. The period is 2 pi times the radius, but the radius for star 2 is quarter d, and the velocity, the tangential speed for star 2 is half. So that's 2 pi times quarter d. d is 2 times 10 to the 10, so quarter d is half times 10 to the 10 over half times 10 to the 5 meters per second. So I get 2 pi times 10 to the 5 seconds. And thankfully, I get that they get the same period, meaning that the two binary stars are rotating around each other with the same period, which is nice because if I think of this is the common center of mass. Here are the two masses, the two massive stars. And this is their common center of mass, and they're both rotating about that common center of mass. The tangential speed of the smaller mass is larger than the tangential speed of the bigger mass, such that in the end, they complete one revolution exactly at the same time. And they always, always have that center of mass is always on the line connecting the two, and the gravitational force is always along that line. It's an attractive force that keeps both stars in orbit.